On February 19, 1982, in the quiet suburban town of Brighton, New York, a horrific crime shocked the city. Kathy Krausneck, a 29-year-old mother, was found brutally murdered in her own home. The discovery was made by her husband, James Krausneck, when he returned from work in the late afternoon. Kathy's body was found in the bed they shared, with an ax lodged deeply into her head. The Krausneck family had recently moved to Brighton for James's new job as an economist at Kodak. On that fateful day, James claimed to have left for work early in the morning. James returned home and was met with a scene of unimaginable horror. Upon entering the house, James immediately noticed something was wrong. The garage door was ajar, and a window between the garage and the house was broken. As he ventured inside, he found the lifeless body of his wife in their bed, an ax embedded in her head. Shocked and speechless, he hurriedly took his daughter to a neighbor's house to ensure her safety and called for help. The police arrived promptly and began their investigation. The crime scene presented a puzzling picture. There were no signs of forced entry apart from the broken window. Additionally, despite the appearance of a disturbed home, nothing of value was stolen, ruling out robbery as a motive. This gruesome discovery sent shockwaves through the neighborhood. Kathy Krausneck's brutal murder and the mysterious circumstances surrounding it left the police and the community searching for answers. Over the next decades, this case would unfold into a complex investigation, leading to a controversial and debated conclusion. As we begin to unravel the events of that tragic day, the focus remains on the chilling and unresolved questions that continue to haunt those involved in the investigation and the lives it forever changed. On the afternoon of February 19, 1982, James Krausnick entered the Brighton police station holding his three-year-old daughter, Sarah. Her hands were smeared with blood and James was visibly shaken. He reported that he had found his wife, Kathy, dead in their home. According to James, he had been at work all day at Kodak, where he worked as an economist. Kathy had planned to stay home with their daughter. James explained that he had left for work that morning. When he returned home, he immediately noticed something was wrong. He ventured inside, where he found Kathy lying in their bed with an ax embedded in her head. Overwhelmed by the sight, he was momentarily speechless. His priority was to ensure Sarah's safety, so he quickly took her to a neighbor's house and asked them to call the police. The police arrived shortly after receiving the call. The initial examination of the crime scene revealed no signs of forced entry, apart from the broken window. The ax used in the murder was found to be from the Krausenex garage. Strangely, there were no fingerprints on the weapon or anywhere else in the house, suggesting that the perpetrator had meticulously cleaned the entire scene. Despite the apparent disturbance in the house, nothing of value was taken. Valuables, including money and jewelry, were left untouched. Items like a tea set and silverware were found neatly arranged, which was unusual for a burglary. During the investigation, the police interviewed young Sarah. She told them she had seen a bad, colorful person in her parents' bed. It was likely her way of describing her mother, given the blood and the traumatic scene she had witnessed. This added a layer of complexity to the case, as it suggested that Sarah might have been present during or shortly after the murder. The lack of fingerprints, the staged appearance of the home, and the absence of any stolen items made the investigation challenging. The police began to gather information about the Krausenek family and their background to find any possible leads. Friends and neighbors described James and Kathy as a perfect couple. Despite the initial portrayal of a happy family, the police dug deeper into their situation. They found a flyer in James's car that advertised solutions for family problems, indicating potential marital issues. James's colleagues at Kodak reported that he had been acting strangely at work and had problems due to his lack of skills. These revelations painted a different picture and raised suspicions about James's involvement in the crime. James Krausneck provided a detailed account of his day to the police. He stated that he left their home at 6.30 a.m. on February 19, 1982, to go to his job at Kodak. According to James, Kathy was alive and well when he departed, planning to spend the day at home with their daughter, Sarah. James described his routine at work, noting that it was a typical day without any unusual occurrences. Upon returning home around 5 p.m., James immediately sensed that something was wrong. The garage door was open, and the window between the garage and the house was broken. As he entered the house, 
he found the lifeless body of his wife in their bed, with an ax embedded in her head. Overcome with shock and fear, James's first instinct was to ensure the safety of their daughter, Sarah. He quickly took her to a neighbor's house and asked them to call the police. James was visibly distraught when he arrived at the police station with Sarah, her hands smeared with her mother's blood. James initially cooperated fully with the police investigation. He answered their questions and provided a detailed timeline of his day. His demeanor was one of shock and grief, and he appeared eager to help the authorities in any way he could. However, despite his cooperation, the police needed more information to rule him out as a suspect. A few days later, the police scheduled a second interrogation with James to gather more details and clarify some points from his initial statement. However, James did not show up for the appointment. Instead, he left the city to visit his parents. While this raised some suspicions, the police considered the possibility that James needed the support of his family during this traumatic time. The police eventually tracked James to his parents' home, where they conducted another interview. During this session, James provided blood and hair samples as part of the investigation. Although DNA testing was not available at the time, the samples were taken for potential future use. James continued to maintain his innocence and reiterated his account of the events on the day of the murder. Ten days after Kathy's death, James hired a lawyer. This move added another layer of complexity to the investigation. The presence of legal counsel meant that James's interactions with the police would now be more controlled and strategic. Despite this, James continued to assert his innocence and expressed a desire to see the real perpetrator brought to justice. Throughout this period, James's emotional state was closely observed by both the police and his neighbors. He appeared to be deeply affected by the loss of his wife, showing signs of distress and grief. However, his decision to leave town shortly after the murder and his subsequent actions raised questions among the investigators. These actions were scrutinized in the context of the case, as the police sought to determine whether they were consistent with the behavior of a grieving husband or if they suggested something more sinister. The initial stages of the investigation were marked by these conflicting impressions of James. On one hand, he was a cooperative and grieving husband, devastated by the loss of his wife. On the other hand, his actions and some aspects of his story raised suspicions that the police could not ignore. As the investigation progressed, these early impressions of James would continue to influence the direction of the case, shaping the perceptions of both the investigators and the public. The complexity of James's behavior and the circumstances surrounding Kathy's murder presented a significant challenge for the police. They needed to balance the emotional and psychological aspects of the case with the hard evidence they were gathering this delicate balance would prove to be a central theme in the ongoing investigation, as the police worked to uncover the truth behind the tragic events of February 19, 1982. The initial forensic analysis of the crime scene provided some critical yet inconclusive information. The autopsy conducted shortly after Kathy Krausnick's death indicated that she had died between 2.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. on February 19, 1982. This broad time frame left open the possibility that either James or an unknown assailant could have committed the crime. The medical examiner noted that Kathy had been struck with a single fatal blow to the head with an ax while she was in bed. At the time, forensic technology was limited. Deoxyribonucleic acid analysis, which is now a cornerstone of criminal investigations, was not available in 1982. As a result, investigators had to rely on more traditional methods of crime scene analysis. The absence of fingerprints on the murder weapon and throughout the house suggested that the killer had gone to great lengths to avoid leaving any traceable evidence. This meticulous cleaning pointed to a perpetrator who was either very cautious or familiar with forensic procedures. The lack of physical evidence, combined with the staged appearance of the crime scene, complicated the investigation. The police collected hair and blood samples from James Krausnick, but without the ability to perform DNA testing, these samples provided limited immediate value. The crime scene itself, with its apparent lack of struggle and the orderly arrangement of household items, suggested that the crime had been carefully planned and executed. Years passed without significant progress in the case. It wasn't until 2015, when advancements in forensic science prompted a re-examination of the evidence that new insights began to emerge. 
Dr. Michael Baden, a renowned forensic pathologist, was brought in to review the case. Dr. Baden's expertise and access to modern forensic techniques provided an opportunity to reevaluate the circumstances surrounding Kathy's death. Dr. Baden conducted a thorough review of the original autopsy report and considered additional factors that had not been fully analyzed in 1982. One critical element he examined was the presence of an electric blanket on the bed where Kathy was found. The blanket had been turned on and Dr. Baden theorized that this could have affected the estimation of the time of death by taking into account the potential impact of the electric blanket on Kathy's body temperature, Dr. Baden concluded that Kathy likely died around 6.30 a.m. This new estimation of the time of death directly contradicted James's alibi, as he had claimed to have left the house at 6.30 a.m. Dr. Baden's analysis suggested that Kathy had been killed shortly before or around the time James was supposedly leaving for work. This crucial piece of evidence reignited suspicions about James's involvement in the murder. Dr. Baden's findings were based on the most current forensic techniques and methodologies available in 2015. He used advanced tools to reassess the state of Kathy's body and the conditions in the bedroom. His conclusions added a new layer of complexity to the case, challenging the initial assumptions made by the investigators in 1982. The reanalysis conducted by Dr. Baden was a significant development in the ongoing investigation it provided a more precise time frame for Kathy's death and cast doubt on James's account of his activities on the morning of the murder. The updated forensic analysis prompted law enforcement to revisit other aspects of the case, including the original crime scene photos, witness statements, and previous leads that had been followed. Despite these advancements, the case remained challenging. The new findings needed to be corroborated with additional evidence to build a stronger case against James, or to identify another potential suspect. The forensic re-examination underscored the importance of continuous advancements in science and technology in solving cold cases and highlighted the difficulties faced by investigators working with limited resources and information. As the investigation moved forward, the insights provided by Dr. Baden played a crucial role in shaping the subsequent legal proceedings. His expert testimony and the updated forensic analysis became key components in the efforts to finally resolve the mystery surrounding Kathy Krausneck's tragic death. As the investigation into Kathy Krausneck's murder progressed, suspicions began to mount against her husband, James. Initially, friends and neighbors had described James and Kathy as the quintessential couple. They had met in school, fallen in love, and married while attending college in 1974. Their daughter, Sarah, was born in 1978 adding joy to their lives. James started his career as a university teacher, which reflected his academic inclination and dedication to education. In 1981, the Krauseneck family relocated to Brighton, New York, after James secured a position as an economist at Kodak. The move was seen as a positive step for the family, offering new opportunities and stability. However, behind the facade of a perfect family, there were subtle signs of trouble, Friends noticed a change in Kathy's behavior about six months before her death. She became more reserved and seemed to be dealing with personal issues, although she did not confide in anyone about the specifics. The police investigation uncovered more details that cast doubt on James's portrayal of their family life. A flyer found in James's car advertised solutions for family problems, suggesting that there might have been underlying marital issues. This discovery, combined with reports from James's colleagues, painted a different picture. At work, James had been acting strangely and had problems due to his lack of skills, which could have added stress to his personal life. James's behavior after the murder also raised eyebrows. While he initially cooperated with the police, his actions soon became a point of concern. He missed a second interrogation and left the city to visit his parents. This decision was seen as suspicious by some, even though the police considered it a natural response to trauma. Furthermore, Hiring a lawyer 10 days after Kathy's death made some question whether he had something to hide. Despite these suspicions, there was another potential suspect who complicated the case. Edward Larrabee, a convicted sex offender, lived near the Krausenecks at the time of Kathy's murder. Larrabee had a long criminal history, including multiple assaults on women. In 2014, shortly before his death in prison, Larrabee confessed to killing Kathy. 
However, his confession was filled with inconsistencies and false details, making it unreliable. For example, he described Kathy inaccurately and provided a timeline that didn't match the known facts of the case. Larrabee's confession was not entirely dismissed, but it did not provide the solid evidence needed to shift the focus away from James. The police had to consider all possibilities, including the chance that Larrabee might be using the confession to gain some form of advantage, as he had done with other crimes. This created a dilemma for the investigators, as they had to weigh the credibility of Larrabee's claims against the suspicious circumstances surrounding James. The investigation into Kathy's murder was further complicated by the community's divided opinions. Some believed James was innocent and a victim of unfortunate circumstances, while others were convinced of his guilt. This division was reflected in the ongoing efforts to gather more evidence and make a conclusive case. Despite the challenges, the police continued to explore every lead. They re-examined the crime scene, revisited witness statements, and looked for any additional evidence that could point to the true perpetrator. The involvement of a high-profile forensic pathologist like Dr. Michael Baden added credibility to the reanalysis of the case, but it also underscored the need for solid, corroborative evidence. As the years went by, the lack of definitive answers left the Krausnet case shrouded in mystery. The investigators faced the daunting task of piecing together a coherent narrative from the fragmented evidence and conflicting testimonies. Each potential lead had to be scrutinized thoroughly, and every hypothesis needed to be tested against the available facts. James's life after Kathy's death continued to be scrutinized. In 1997, he met Sharon, and they married in 1999. Despite his trauma from Kathy's death, James and Sharon traveled across the country, trying to move forward while the investigation loomed in the background. Sharon stood by James, insisting on his innocence and supporting him through the ongoing legal battles. The complexities of the Krausnet case highlighted the difficulties faced by law enforcement in solving cold cases. The investigation was a delicate balance of analyzing old evidence with new technologies, considering alternate theories, and navigating the legal and emotional intricacies involved. The persistent efforts of the investigators reflected their commitment to seeking justice for Kathy, despite the many obstacles they encountered. The case remained open, with investigators hoping that new breakthroughs in forensic science or fresh evidence would eventually lead to a resolution. In 2015, the investigation into Kathy Krausneck's murder was reignited with the support of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Advancements in forensic science and a fresh perspective on the evidence brought new hope for solving this decades-old case. The renewed investigation aimed to review all the evidence collected over the years and re-examine the interviews conducted with key witnesses. One of the primary focuses of the renewed investigation was the timeline of Kathy's death. The original autopsy had placed her time of death between 2.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m., but Dr. Michael Baden's reanalysis suggested she had likely died around 6.30 a.m. This crucial piece of information contradicted James's alibi and placed him at the scene during the likely time of the murder. Investigators meticulously reviewed the crime scene photos, forensic reports, and any new information that had come to light since the initial investigation. The FBI's involvement brought additional resources and expertise to the case. They re-examined the physical evidence using the latest forensic techniques, hoping to uncover new clues that had been missed previously. The team also conducted a comprehensive review of all interviews, looking for inconsistencies or details that might have been overlooked. In addition to the forensic re-examination, investigators also scrutinized James's behavior and actions before and after the murder. They analyzed his work records, personal life, and any potential motives that could explain why he might have committed the crime. This thorough review aimed to build a comprehensive picture of the events leading up to and following Kathy's death. The renewed investigation culminated in a grand jury indictment on November 8, 2019. James Krausneck was charged with second-degree murder. This decision was based on the cumulative evidence pointing towards his involvement in the crime. Despite the indictment, James maintained his innocence and pleaded not guilty. He was released on bail while awaiting trial. The indictment brought a mix of relief and renewed anxiety to those connected to the case. For Kathy's family, it represented a step towards justice, even though it had taken nearly four decades. For James and his supporters, 
It was another chapter in a long and painful ordeal. The legal proceedings that followed were closely watched by the public, reflecting the enduring interest and controversy surrounding the case. James's decision to voluntarily go to the police on November 8, 2019, highlighted his continued insistence on his innocence. He cooperated with the authorities, but never admitted guilt. This stance was consistent with his behavior throughout the investigation, where he had always maintained that he had no involvement in his wife's murder. As the case moved towards trial, both the prosecution and defense prepared to present their arguments. The prosecution focused on the inconsistencies in James's statements, the forensic evidence suggesting he was present at the time of the murder, and the suspicious circumstances surrounding his actions. The defense, on the other hand, aimed to highlight the lack of direct evidence, the possible involvement of alternate suspects like Edward Larrabee, and the impact of the flawed initial investigation. The reopening of the case in 2015 and the subsequent indictment in 2019 marked significant milestones in the long pursuit of justice for Kathy Krausneck. The legal process that followed was expected to finally bring clarity and resolution to a case that had haunted the Brighton community for decades. The renewed efforts by law enforcement underscored their commitment to solving the case, demonstrating the advancements in forensic science and the persistent quest for truth and justice. The legal proceedings in the case against James Krausneck began with intense scrutiny from both the public and the media. The trial, which took place nearly four decades after Kathy Krausneck's murder, was set to determine whether James was guilty of second-degree murder. The prosecution and defense prepared to present their arguments, each side hoping to sway the jury with their interpretation of the evidence. The prosecution's case centered around the idea that the crime scene had been meticulously staged to look like a burglary gone wrong. They argued that James's alibi did not hold up under closer examination and that the timeline suggested by Dr. Michael Baden's forensic analysis placed James at the scene at the time of the murder. Prosecutors highlighted the lack of forced entry, the absence of fingerprints, and the staged appearance of the house as key indicators that the crime had been carefully planned. Prosecutors also emphasized the findings of the renewed investigation, particularly Dr. Baden's conclusion that Kathy likely died around 6.30 a.m., the same time James claimed to have left for work. This crucial piece of evidence was used to challenge James's account and suggest that he had the opportunity and motive to commit the crime. The prosecution presented a narrative in which James, facing marital and work-related stresses, killed his wife and then staged the scene to cover his tracks. The defense, on the other hand, focused on the lack of direct evidence linking James to the murder. They pointed out that no physical evidence, such as fingerprints or DNA, tied James to the crime. The defense also highlighted the confession of Edward Larrabee, the convicted sex offender who had lived near the Krausnecks and had confessed to the murder shortly before his death. While Larrabee's confession was inconsistent and unreliable, the defense argued that it introduced reasonable doubt about James's guilt. Key testimonies during the trial came from a range of witnesses, including family members, friends, and forensic experts. Kathy's family testified about her relationship with James, their life together, and any signs of trouble they might have noticed. Friends and neighbors provided additional context about the couple's life in Brighton, describing them as a seemingly happy family, but noting the changes in Kathy's behavior before her death. Forensic experts, including Dr. Michael Baden, took the stand to explain the forensic evidence and the conclusions drawn from it. Dr. Baden's testimony was crucial in establishing the estimated time of death and the implications it had for James's alibi. Other experts discussed the lack of physical evidence at the scene and the possibility that the crime had been staged to mislead investigators. The trial proceedings were intense, with both sides presenting compelling arguments. The prosecution focused on the forensic evidence and the inconsistencies in James's statements, while the defense aimed to create doubt by highlighting the absence of direct evidence and presenting alternate theories. After several weeks of testimony and deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. On the basis of the cumulative evidence and the arguments presented, James Krausneck was found guilty of second-degree murder. The verdict was a significant moment in the case, bringing a sense of closure to some, but also sparking further debate among others. James was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. The sentencing marked the end of a long and arduous journey for justice in the case of Kathy Krausneck's murder. For Kathy's family, 
The verdict and sentencing brought a measure of justice and resolution, even though it had taken nearly 40 years to achieve. The trial and its outcome were closely followed by the public and the media. The case had drawn significant attention due to its complexity, the long passage of time, and the questions it raised about forensic science, legal procedures, and the nature of justice. The verdict was seen by many as a testament to the persistence of law enforcement and the advancements in forensic science that had made it possible to solve such an old case. James maintained his innocence throughout the trial and in the years that followed. His defense team filed appeals, arguing that the verdict was based on circumstantial evidence and that reasonable doubt had not been adequately considered. The appeals process continued, reflecting the ongoing legal battle and the divided opinions about James's guilt. The sentencing of James Krausneck to 25 years to life in prison marked a pivotal moment in the long quest for justice for Kathy Krausneck. It highlighted the challenges and complexities involved in solving cold cases and underscored the importance of forensic advancements and persistent investigative efforts. The case remains a poignant example of the impact of crime on families and communities and the enduring pursuit of truth and justice. The aftermath of the trial and the verdict in the case against James Krausnick brought a mix of emotions and reactions from those involved and the public. Kathy's family expressed relief and a sense of justice finally being served after nearly four decades. They believed that the guilty verdict against James provided some measure of closure, even though the pain of losing Kathy could never be fully alleviated. On the other hand, James's supporters, including his daughter Sarah, firmly maintained his innocence. Sarah, who had been just three years old at the time of her mother's death, stood by her father throughout the trial and its aftermath. She believed that James had been wrongfully convicted and that the true perpetrator had not been brought to justice. This unwavering support from his daughter was a significant source of strength for James as he faced his prison sentence and the ongoing legal battles. James's new wife, Sharon, also played a crucial role in supporting him during this tumultuous period. Sharon and James had married in 1999, and despite the trauma of James's past and the shadow of Kathy's murder, they had built a life together. Throughout the trial and its aftermath, Sharon publicly defended James, insisting on his innocence and describing him as a kind and supportive husband. Her steadfast belief in his innocence added another layer of complexity to the public's perception of the case. The case and its outcome also had a significant impact on public opinion. The divided views on James's guilt reflected the broader uncertainties and questions that remained unanswered. Some members of the public saw the verdict as a triumph of justice, made possible by advancements in forensic science and the dedication of law enforcement. Others, however, were skeptical of the evidence and remained unconvinced of James's guilt, viewing the case as an example of the potential flaws and limitations of the legal system. The extensive media coverage of the case played a significant role in shaping public opinion. Major news outlets, including Dateline, featured detailed reports on the investigation, the trial, and the subsequent verdict. These media portrayals highlighted the dramatic elements of the case, from the brutal nature of Kathy's murder to the decades-long quest for justice. In 2021, the case gained further attention with the release of a Netflix movie inspired by the events surrounding Kathy's murder. The film dramatized the investigation and the trial, bringing the story to a wider audience and reigniting public interest in the case. The portrayal of the case in popular media contributed to the ongoing discussions and debates about the evidence, the verdict, and the broader implications for the criminal justice system. The appeals process continued as James and his legal team sought to overturn the conviction. They argued that the verdict was based on circumstantial evidence and that the prosecution had not proven James's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The appeals highlighted the complexities and challenges involved in adjudicating cold cases, where the passage of time can obscure evidence and complicate the search for truth. As the legal battles continued, the case of Kathy Krausneck remained a poignant example of the enduring impact of violent crime on families and communities. It underscored the importance of advancements in forensic science and the persistence of law enforcement in seeking justice. At the same time, it also highlighted the potential for controversy and division when questions about guilt and innocence remain unresolved. The Krausenek case, with its mix of personal tragedy, forensic intrigue, and legal drama, 
will likely continue to be a topic of discussion and analysis for years to come. It serves as a reminder of the complexities and challenges inherent in the pursuit of justice and the ways in which such cases can profoundly affect the lives of those involved. Thank you for joining us today as we explored the complex and enduring case of Kathy Krausneck's murder. We hope this detailed look into the investigation, trial, and aftermath has provided a deeper understanding of the challenges faced in seeking justice. If you found this video informative and engaging, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others who might be interested. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to stay notified about our latest content. Your support helps us continue to bring you more true crime stories and in-depth analyses. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video.